I'd like to say uh, a word about the extraordinary phenomenon of migration uh, from Central America to the United States. Um, those of you who are in the U.S. Um, in uh, 2006, which was last year, just a couple of months ago, um, woke up many, of, many people, of course, to uh, this extraordinary phenomenon of massive migration uh, to the United States, especially from Mexico, Central America, and South America. Um, uh, we now have in the United States about 12 million undocumented workers, and uh, Hispanic peoples are the largest minority uh, group uh, in the U.S. population. Uh, here in El Salvador, the U.S. ambassador told me a couple of years ago, this was probably when fewer people left each day, he told me that by the embassy's calculations, about 700 or more people left El Salvador each day for the United States. Now, we're a country that is fewer than 7 million, so figure that out. If uh, 700 were to stay out each day, we would lose about 1% of the population every three months. Fortunately, they're not all making it to the United States. Some of those people represent a second try and a third try. And you have to imagine the same phenomenon in Honduras, hundreds of people leaving a day, in Guatemala, the same thing, hundreds of people leaving a day, and probably thousands from Mexico heading north. The reason they do that is especially uh, to put food on the table, fathers, mothers especially, who cannot uh, feed their children, and uh, young people who are denied education and denied opportunities for decent participation in life and for getting ahead. Uh, with the model of economy that is exclusionary, uh, in these countries, all of them that I described. I think of my friend uh, David Fabian, who is uh, an undocumented worker in Southern California. David, for many, for years really, uh, told me of, of his anguish uh, about not being able to feed his children, about not being able to provide for them a decent uh, life. And uh, one day he took off for the North, and he continues to uh, send back uh, remittances to his family and call them regularly. They're regular parishioners, uh, him and his wonderful, wonderful four beautiful children. Many people like him. I think of Olga, a Honduran friend of mine, who told me that she tried unsuccessfully seven times with her family members to make it from Honduras to the United States. How they were chased by thieves and how they were harassed and how they were injured and deported back um, to Guatemala and then she returned to Honduras. Um, these people now are able to uh, pay a large sum of money. Uh, you know, relatives in the north will, will help them with the first payment and they're able to then get a coyote or uh, uh, someone to come north with the assurance that they will get their uh, safety and sound. It's now a big business. Um, El Salvador has now, according to the government, about 2.6 2 million uh, people in the United States compared to about 6.5 million or 7 million here. If the present rate of migration continues in about 25 years, we can expect that half of the Salvadorans will be living in the United States. That's not far-fetched. Um, that happened uh, to Puerto Ricans in uh, the 90s. There are now a majority of Puerto Rican people living in the continental United States. A minority live in the island. The conditions that are producing the migration are not about to change in the short term. It would really require a Marshall Plan on the part of, with a great deal of help from the United States. But although the United States gave a million and a half dollars uh, during the war, to uh, try to defeat the guerrillas uh, during the 1980s. Uh, it's not uh, willing to provide this type of uh, aid uh, uh, in this post-war period. Uh, besides uh, this uh, massive migration uh, that I'm talking about, 
Uh, we have the reaction of authorities in the United States, especially um, uh, in uh, 2006, uh, in the electoral campaign, when uh, the government uh, and government officials, both Democrat and Republic, Republican, wanted to demonstrate that they were taking control uh, of the boundaries, of our uh, southern boundary in the United States. Uh, and they have stepped up the, uh, not only the control of the border, but also especially the deportation of um, Central American and Mexican immigrants. Uh, in, in 2006, on an average day, 39 people were deported by air from El Salvador, uh, from the United States to El Salvador. It was 14,000 people. It doubled the number from the previous year. And this year, the Salvadoran government has a kind of agreement with the United States government that it will receive five plane loads of people with a maximum of 120 people in each plane being deported from the United States. This is simply unbelievable. But if that weren't enough, Mexico is deporting even more. Each day, buses come back from Mexico, probably in being leaned on by the United States government, sending back people from southern Mexico to El Salvador. And El Salvador is only one country. If 14,000 people came back deported by air uh, last year from the United States, the number in Guatemala was 18,000, or 49 people a day on the average deported from the United States. And in Honduras, it reached almost 25,000, uh, which would have been, which would be an average of 68 people a day being deported back by air from the United States. It's an amazing phenomenon. And uh, in addition, as I said, Mexico is deporting about 250,000 people back to Central America from its own uh, southern border area uh, as part of this effort to detain the flow. The drama of migration is uh, causing incredible upheaval uh, in families and it's causing dependency of these countries on the United States. Um, Salvadoran uh, migrants in the United States sent back over three billion dollars uh, this past year um, to their families, uh, and it amounts to about 17% of our gross national product. Uh, without that, we would be a total economic basket case. The Hondurans send back, they say, 25% of their entire economy from the United States, the Hondurans that are in the United States. And as a result of that, the United States is able to pressure uh, in elections, in these countries that people vote for parties that are favorable to the United States so that they do not deport all these people or they do not uh, cut off the remittances that, that they are sending back. In the United States, or in, in El Salvador, the dependency on the United States is really dramatic. We are the only country with troops in Iraq. Our economy is completely dollarized. We have a military base and we have the FBI in the country. I work in a, an inner city parish where there was a big raid uh, by uh, 171 Salvadoran police officers on April 5th of this past year, and they were accompanied by armed FBI agents. So you can see that these countries are becoming not only transnational and binational with very high percentages of their uh, people uh, in the United States, they're also becoming politically and economically uh, intertwined with the economy and politics of the United States. Uh, this presents a crisis and a difficulty, but also an opportunity. It presents an opportunity for us to exercise international solidarity from the United States in collaboration with Central Americans and migrants uh, and people back home to produce the sustained local development, local economic development, that is not taking place and not being um, generated by the local governments here uh, that are more uh, in service to, uh, to the wealthy than they are to the majorities.
So it presents a great challenge, challenge to us. Uh, challenge also as church, I think, because the church has uh, the possibility of uh, globalizing solidarity, as John Paul II uh, used to put it.